Appearance affects how we are perceived. When men see a colleague arrive at a business conference in a Mercedes-Benz GLS Maybach 60, wearing a Patek Philippe watch and 1985 Jordan 1 OG high top sneakers costing $80,000, he must be competent, disciplined, confident, and successful. I mean, just look at him. When a woman arrives at a charity event with perfectly styled and colored hair, flawless skin, and manicured nails, wearing a Giorgio Armani beaded silk gown, Christian Louboutin shoes, and carrying a Hermes Birkin bag, she is obviously a woman of stature, character, and approachability. I mean, just look at her. It's much the same at church. If a handsome husband and wife visit your church with three beautiful, well-behaved children next Sunday, and they know all the words to your worship songs, fill out your visitor's card, make a generous first Sunday donation, and even volunteer to help in the nursery, it's obvious that they are mature, godly people and candidates for future leadership roles. I mean, just look at them. But Jesus warned us in Matthew 6, verse 1, Be careful not to practice your righteousness in front of others to be seen by them, and to beware of those who wear their righteousness on the outside of their lives. In previous podcasts, Jesus warned about those who give to be seen as generous, people who pray to be seen as spiritual. And this week, he will warn us of those who fast to be seen as people who fast. Join Kent Edwards, Nathan Norman, and Vicki Hitzkiss as they discover when and how Christians should fast. Welcome to Crosstalk, a Christian podcast whose goal is for us to encourage each other to not only increase our knowledge of the Bible, but to take the next step beyond information into transformation. Our goal is to bring the Bible to life, into all our lives. I'm Brian French. Today, Dr. Kent Edwards, Vicki Hitzkiss, and Nathan Norman continue their discussion through the Gospel of Matthew. And if you have a Bible handy, turn to Matthew chapter 6, verses 1 to 18, as we join their discussion. Nathan, Vicki, have you known people in your churches for whom fasting was an ongoing spiritual discipline? I know my mother fasted, and I had a sweet, sweet friend that was going through a tough time, and I showed up at her apartment. She, her husband was in seminary, and I, I, I know Satan had me do it because I, I rarely went to her apartment. And I, I don't even remember what I had, but I came with, with all kinds of food, and she <laughs> said no. And I said, oh, look at this. She was from India. I said, oh, Suda, look at this. And I, I just kept pushing it on her. And she kept saying, no, well, she was fasting and she oh. didn't want to tell me. And um, <laughs> I couldn't understand. I kept saying, Suda, this is your favorite stuff. Eat it, eat it, eat it. <laughs> but otherwise, I don't really know people who fast. Mm. Yeah, I don't either. And in my some odd years, decades now of ministry, only very rarely, kind of like what you were saying, Vicky, is I, I kind of stumble upon it where it's like, oh, can we go out for lunch? No, let's let's not do that. Only very rarely have I known. Now, I do see when people, you know, declare on social media that they're taking a social media fast or or, or if they're like, hey, you know, this fast is really hard not eating cookies during this season, right? Yeah. Um, no, so some people not, some yeah. people will do that, yeah. but um that's no, I don't, I don't really hear people talking about fasting that much. No, I remember um, <clears throat> when I was in southern India years ago, speaking to a group of hundreds of pastors, the first question is, how often do American pastors fast? Uh, yeah, I didn't want to answer that question. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Why not? Why isn't fasting popular in America? I think one of the reasons is you get hungry. I mean... <laughs> <laughs> well, that's the obvious reason. I don't think I don't think our tur our churches teach it. No. That wasn't one of the disciplines I grew up with. I saw my mother do it, but it wasn't really taught in our homes and it was not taught in Sunday school as I was growing up. Yeah. No, and it's very much against the American ethos mm -hmm. of of, you know, have it your way, fast and ready right now, immediate gratification. Uh, denial of self and uh, denial of your basic needs is not an American virtue or value. You know, it's fascinating that um, as I look around the world, we've seen in past um, podcasts how 
prayer and giving are both very prominent in all major uh, religions. But so also is fasting. I mean, it's really, really prominent. Um, in Islam, fasting is one of their five pillars. I mean, it's huge. Uh, you can't uh, be a Muslim without fasting. And they fast for the entire month of Ramadan. They don't eat at all? Not during the day. Now, apparently they party like crazy when the sun goes down. But during huh. the day, no, they're not allowed to. Our, our Jewish friends have six days of fasting per year. In Hinduism... Whoa, which is why I'm not surprised that your Indian friend mm -hmm. uh, was fasting. That's a huge part of the Hindu faith. People fast at least twice a month, depending on what the moon is doing. The day will change. They also fast at least five during five festivals. They fast, uh, depending on your favorite god or goddess, you may fast on Saturday to appease the god of Saturn. You'll fast on Tuesday if you want to appease the monkey god. On Fridays, devotees of the goddess uh, Santoshi Mata fast. Um, and the founder of Buddhism, uh, another world religion, also fasted in order to achieve enlightenment or nirvana. I mean, it's huge. In fact, as I was reading, some of the oldest religions ever discovered uh, emphasized fasting. So why don't... Evangelical Christians, at least in the U.S., fast regularly? Well, one of the reasons, when I find this surprising, is that God does not command fasting. He commands prayer. He commands giving. God has no problem commanding. But he doesn't command fasting. I was stunned to discover that God only required Israel to fast one day a year in the Old Testament. On the Day of Atonement. Hmm. What? we call Yom Kippur today. And the New Testament does not include one command to fast. Not one. Did you know that? Well, I did, because when I was in seminary, you uh, forced us to read your book, <laughs> <laughs> Deep Preaching, which is good and life-changing, so I highly recommend it to people. <laughs> no, I was stunned. I mean, I was looking at what are the essential spiritual disciplines, and I would have prayer and meditation, and I tried to include fasting, but it's not. It is not commanded. Unlike every other religion, God does not force us to fast. He takes no pleasure in <laughs> us going hungry, but neither does Jesus discourage fasting. I mean, as Jesus says in the Sermon on the Mount, starting in Matthew 6, verse 16, what does he say? He says, when you fast, it's just assumed here, mm -hmm. when you fast, do not look somber as the hypocrites do, for they disfigure their faces to show others they are fasting. Truly, I tell you, they have received their reward in full. But, and this is what my friend Suda was doing, she didn't want to tell me she was fasting. Right, right. But when you fast, put oil on your head and wash your face so it will not be obvious to others that you are fasting, but only to your Father who is unseen. And your father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. So it's never commanded, but always assumed, right? And we see people fasting in Old Testament and New Testament. It uh, was not an unusual practice, but never commanded. Well, that made me think about, well, what exactly is fasting? So at least here's my definition. Fasting is our reflexive response to overwhelming situations that result in a cessation of eating as we seek God, the only one who can help us in our crisis. There's a traumatic situation that is so great that our automatic response is just to stop eating. I've seen that uh, in my pastoral ministry. I remember one... Um, one woman in a church I was pastoring, her husband had cancer. It was obviously terminal. And there were only, you know, who knew how long he, the man had. This woman loved her husband and she went to the hospital. I mean, she didn't just go. She stayed. I mean, she didn't want to miss one moment with her husband. She wanted to cherish every, every moment. And, um, and she forgot to eat. She had no desire to eat. She just wanted to be with him. We had to come and bring food in and try and get her to eat. She, she did not want to eat. That, that was her response to that desperate need that she had. 
Nathan, if you found that one of your children, uh, you got a call and said one of your children had been hit by a car and was in the hospital, on the way, would you stop for some great New York pizza? No. 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 Obviously not. It would not occur to you, right? No. Not even. Because in that moment of panic, the last thing we think about is food. And so it's something like that that happens, I think, in our life. When there's a traumatic event, we simply forget to eat. We are fasting. It's not a, it's not a discipline. It's a reality. And as I look in the Bible, I see two kinds of trauma that uh, bring people to forget to eat because they just so want only God. They need him more than anything else. One of those is Exodus 34. Do you remember that scene, uh, Nathan, when um, Moses was, went up to the mountain to uh, commune with God and get the law? Yeah, he didn't eat for 40 days. <laughs> Reminds yes. me of someone else, right? Yeah, Jesus in the, the wilderness fighting Satan. So why do you think he didn't eat? Did he forget to pack a lunch? No, he could was... Could God have given him manna or something? He most certainly could have. He was sure. overwhelmed with the presence of God. Yeah, can you imagine? Remember when God said, uh, when Moses said he wanted to see God, and God said, I will only show you my backside, mm. because my glory be so great, you would be consumed. When Moses came down, he looked a bit different, didn't he? Yeah, his face was glowing with the glory of God. Oh. And with that kind of experience, traumatic, I don't mean negative. I mean overwhelming, just an overwhelming experience. He wanted to see God. He wasn't concerned about food. Uh, Vicki, do you remember in Acts 9 when um, Paul, the uh, persecutor of the church, kind of got a big surprise? Oh, yeah, of course. <laughs> He was on his way to Damascus. He was a persecutor of Christians, mm -hmm. and Christ intervened and said, why are you persecuting me? And yeah. it changed him forever. Well, can you imagine the shock? No. Here, Paul thought he was on God's side doing God's work by attacking Christians, right? He was oh, a persecutor. Oh, that's a good point. Yeah. Okay, so he's right on. I, I'm doing this for God. And as on the way... Yeah, the one that uh, Jesus, who was crucified, shows up in person and says, uh, I'm here, buddy. Um, stop it. And he was so traumatized that um, he didn't eat or drink anything, the Bible tells us, for three days. Mm. That, it's not that he was, decided to go on a fast. He was so stunned. His worldview was so overwhelmed that it never occurred to him uh, to eat. Um, he was having a direct experience with God. So I think there's times when God shows up and we see him in a new way that is so amazing, so wonderful. We don't even think about food. And there's times when life becomes so overwhelming that we don't think about food. Uh, do you remember what happened in the book of Esther? Yeah, Haman had a plan to destroy the entire Jewish community and hmm. annihilate them. And their response was too fast. Yeah. Why? Well, the situation was overwhelming and it overwhelmed them and they needed God more than they needed food. Yeah. I mean, they were releasing the army, telling all people they could go kill all the Jews and the Jews had no way to defend themselves. They were faced with annihilation. And they cried out for God, and they asked for his help in a way that was more important than food. Skipping ahead to Jesus in his earthly ministry, we alluded earlier, Jesus fasted, right? Before his ministry began? Right, the Holy Spirit led him into the wilderness where he was uh, tempted by Satan, and uh, he fasted for 40 days. Hmm. And why? Why did he fast for 40 days? To get into ministry shape, lose a few pounds? <laughs> what no. was so what was so traumatic that caused Jesus to fast for 40 days? Well, that supernatural battle he had with the devil. He needed God's strength more than he needed anything else including the basics of food. Right. So Jesus was led by the Holy Spirit into the wilderness and he's waiting for Satan, right? He knows Satan's going to come. And Satan's goal would be to get Jesus to sin. And if he sinned, what would have been the consequences? 
none of us would be forgiven. All of humanity would be spiritually bankrupt for eternity. Yeah. And, and the stakes were so high because Jesus came because he loved us. The ones he loved so much, their destiny held in the, hung in the balance. And he wanted to make sure that he was ready with God's power to face the greatest temptation anyone had ever seen. That's why he fasted. It was a moment of, of trauma. So why do you think Jesus says in Matthew chapter 6, which you read earlier, Vicki, when you fast, do not look somber as the hypocrites do, but when you fast, put oil on your head and wash your face. Why does he say well, that? I, well, I changed when I first read it, I thought it was this, because we have been reading that we shouldn't be pious, falsely pious. Right. And so I thought he was saying that, don't be falsely pious. But I don't think he's saying that now. Now I think he's saying, realize that God is in your actions. And when you, when you expect God to act and you throw yourself upon him, he will act. Mm -hmm. It may not be the way you want, but... My dad used to use the phrase, throw yourself with reckless abandon on the Lord. Yep. God God will be there. And I mm -hmm. think that's what he's saying here. This is an act of the heart. This is an act. This is perhaps one of the most intimate experiences we can have with God. When we are so overwhelmed that only he can meet us at our point of greatest need, whether it's understanding him or facing a situation, it is maybe the epitome of intimacy uh, with God. Yeah, you're saying, I need you more than food. Yes. And in Luke 18, Jesus tells us that infamous parable of the Pharisee and the tax collector. The Pharisee stood up in the temple and bragged before God and humanity about his practice of fasting twice a week. <laughs> uh, it's only required once a year, he did it twice a week. But do you remember Jesus' words at the end of the parable? Oh, he said, all those who exalt themselves will be humbled, and all those who humble themselves will be exalted. So I was right the first time. He is, God is insulted, insulted by fake fasting. It is <laughs> fasting for show. Um, maybe like uh, proposing marriage to your fiance with a with a ring featuring a, a chunk of cubic zirconium and pretending it is a diamond. <laughs> they look pretty similar, don't they, Vicky? You can't tell anymore. Yeah, but when she finds out, when the bride <laughs> finds out that it was fake, is that going to cause a problem? It could. <laughs> well, no, it because sure she, could. If he lied about it, yeah. right? If he was faking yeah. it, then yeah. that's a that's an issue. If you do that, doing so makes you a fraud. It insults your would-be wife. In fact, it would be better not to give a ring at all than trying to pass off a fake ring as a genuine article. Because fasting is a spontaneous act spawned out of desperation. It's practiced during times of extreme crisis. When our need for God is so great, that we forget to eat. Now, I, it can't be forced or faked. We can call people to fast and explain to them like they did in the Old Testament sometimes. The king would tell the people, I'm asking you to fast. That's not a command, that's a reality. Look, we're surrounded, we're going to die. I have no plan B or plan A. If God doesn't show up, no, we're done. We need God's help. No, it's fine to explain to people how dire the situation is. And when they understand, yeah, they respond, not not out of fake demonstration, but of an urgent need that only God can that only God can provide. We fast when we face a spiritual situation so desperate that only God is good enough. When we need His presence more than anything else, even food, it's an involuntary response to an overwhelming situation. So, 
I could have a private word to my fellow preachers. I don't think that you and I need to feel obligated to fast every week or every month because we don't fast to gain God's favor. We fast to gain his presence. But just a little warning, if we look back and we cannot remember when we last fasted, we should ask, why not? Am I so proud that I didn't realize my need for God? Have I become so blasé with God that he no longer takes my breath away? Ugh. Fasting isn't commanded, but it is a normal response of Christians in their relationship with God and as they deal with the obstacles of life. So let's remember what Jesus said, starting in verse 16, Vicki. When you fast, do not look somber as the hypocrites do, for they disfigure their faces to show others they are fasting. But when you fast, your Father, who sees what is done in secret, will reward you. He will reward you by coming near to you. And he's waiting. Why should we fast? Or should we? And what happens if and when we do? We fast to grow closer to God. It's not commanded of us in Scripture. It's assumed. When we fast, we draw close to God, and God draws close to us. I trust that today's discussion of God's Word has been helpful and serves as an encouragement to not just be hearers of the Word, but doers. Together, let's bring God's Word to life, to our lives, this week. The Crosstalk Podcast is a production of Crosstalk Global, equipping biblical communicators so every culture hears God's voice. To find out more, or to support the work of this ministry, please visit www.crosstalkglobal.org. You can also support this show by sharing it on your social media and telling your friends. Join us next Friday for a special guest interview. You won't want to miss it. Yeah, I remember uh, COVID-19. Um, we finally came back and we were meeting outside. And so, uh, what am I going to preach? Oh, uh, Joel. They went through a catastro catastrophe. We'll, we'll preach through Joel. So, our response to that text, he calls for the day of fasting. And so, I said, all right. So, we're all, you know, I'm calling um, us to fast on, I don't know, it was Wednesday. And <clears throat> kind of gave him instructions on, on that. And then we'll gather together for a prayer meeting um, that evening. And, uh, you know, we did it. And I was like, oh, this is great. You know, it was good. So, so then the next natural unit in Joel, he calls for another day of fasting. <laughs> <laughs> and everyone's like, oh, my gosh. <laughs> and we did it. We did. It. So we did it again. And we got together again and prayed. We prayed outside near the road, you know, and um, kind of a prophetic act. And and then uh, the third week, everyone, one of the deacons came up. He's like, if the big idea is that we have to fast again, I'm going to punch you in the nose. <laughs> <laughs> it was not. <laughs> oh, but it was it was amazing. You heard the, that second one where it was like, oh, okay. That was amazing. That was so good. It was so good. Yeah, it was so good, wasn't it? It was. We should do it again. Uh, uh. Uh. <laughs> oh.